Okay, so Warren just talked about how temperature is varying in the basins and uh, there was a question about how that might vary with flow. So I'm, I'm gonna now talk about uh, flow observations in the OSF. So we're looking at uh, just 10 of those 54 basins and uh, this, is, this is sort of what a, what a, lot, a number of our basins look like and the information we're collecting. So there, there's three main pieces. About once a year we're going out and we're, we're measuring a cross section of the stream. Uh, five or six times a year we're physically going out and measuring flow and then also checking the elevation of the water on a staff gauge. And then throughout the year we have a sensor that's underwater that's continuously measuring the depth of the water. With this information, uh, our goal is to an establish a rating curve, which is just an empirical relation between the depth of the water and flow. Um, so here is a rating curve for Basin 554. And typically when you establish a rating curve, it's, uh, it's either visually fit or maybe using some, some sort of mathematical method. You, you fit a power function to your observed flow and flow depth. Uh, it has three coefficients. You just vary the coefficients until you, you minimize the difference between the, the, the rating and your observations. You'll notice that with our observations, most of them are down here in the lower flows, which is you know, more like this or maybe a little higher. It's, it's really hard to be out there for these types of flows. This was on the, the Klaal River, this was a 1.3 year event. So we were pretty lucky to be out there and see that one. Now the purpose of doing all this is simply to characterize the flow conditions in the OSF. And then maybe in the future, uh, we can do things like relate flow to, to temperature. Uh, but in general, we just want to know how much of the year is the stream like this versus like this. We're not the only ones to be doing this, uh, uh, especially down in Oregon uh, at the H.J. Andrews. Uh, they've been doing very carefully well-designed experiments aimed at evaluating how forestry or how tree farms affect stream flow. Their, uh, their experiments are set up so they're using paired basins. They're adjacent to each other. One is, was completely harvested right down to the stream, the other untouched. And then at the, the outlets of their streams, they have these uh, carefully designed weirs where their power equation, with ours we have those three coefficients we're trying to determine, theirs are known. These have been determined in laboratory experiments uh, by engineers. So they know exactly how the water's changing, or not exactly, but, but much more precisely than we do, how the water's changing in response to these different uh, vegetation scenarios in the basin. So this is our weir. It's, it has rolling gravels. Um, you know, the width is hard to define. There's our staff gauge. We go out there a couple times a year and measure flow. But we're not, we're not making up this method. There are established protocols for how you estimate flow from uh, using this type of method. The USGS provides methods. Uh, unfortunately, their methods really are designed for the channels that they're monitoring. They're, they're generally putting their gauges in sort of stable channels, big channels that aren't moving like ours. We've got all those moving gravels. And they, for their methods, they typically require about 10 measurements per year. We're only getting about five or six. So their methods really aren't suitable for our small mobile streams where we're not able to get out there quite as much. Fortunately, in uh, the last four or five years, really about since this program was started, there's been major improvements for methods for estimating flow using a gauge uh, by this research group in France. Uh, the National Research Institute of Science and Technology for Environment and Agriculture. This research group there um, is developing a or has developed a method and they provide a, a software online that you can use that one, incorporates your flow observations and two, incorporates uh, known coefficient values for different weir structures. It provides a framework for at different levels of flow uh, which weir structure to use. So here's an example of how it works. At low flow, your stream may be down in this small and narrow section of the channel. Uh, at, that, at that height, that 
uh, the geometry is similar to a weir. The weir, the, the coefficients for that power equation are known, so we can we first start with this equation for estimating flow. At high flow, the maybe the, the cobbles that are forming this weir-like structure get overpowered by the flow. The surface of the water becomes parallel to the bed surface, and now we're into more of a power function like this. Again, we have coefficients to start with, so we have a way for estimating flow. So what's that look like in our, in our channels? Here we are in more of a low flow where these uh, boulders and cobbles are, they're creating a flat pool here. And then you have a, a little fall here, so we can, use, we can use our section control. Once the stage or the depth of that water gets higher, our water surface is parallel to the bed and we start using this equation. So this, using this method, without even taking any measurements, we have a way to estimate a rating curve, a relation between the depth of the water and the flow. And because the civil engineers, they've been, through experiments, establishing the coefficients for all those different structures so they can design ditches and dams, we have all sorts of different geometries that we can use to define our channels and begin with known coefficients. So we have our prior estimate of the rating curve from the weir structures, then we incorporate our flow observations, and we get our posterior estimate for our rating curve. So despite having a lit limited number of observations, uh, we're able to incorporate prior information to improve our estimate of that uh, water depth and flow uh, relation. But that doesn't that doesn't solve our second problem. We've got mobile channels. So we've, we've figured out a way to establish a more reliable rating curve, but we still have channels that are moving. So when do we need to establish the new rating curves? Uh, typically, that channel you just saw there, that, this basin we had to abandon because that there, there was too much channel change. Most of our basins are, are like this, where they're grading 5 to 15 centimeters. And we've come up, come up with three different methods for determining when we need new rating curves. One is simply those surveys, that picture on the, the, the second slide, every year we're going out, we're measuring the same cross section over, so we get, at least on an annual resolution, we have, we have an idea of when the channel geometry is changing. Another, another method called specific gauge analysis is simply where you compare your observed flow and depth to that maybe a first initial rating curve, and if that relation changes, you know that the channel geometry may have changed. So right here, right around 2015, November, there was a change. And a third method is looking at accumulated precipitation into the basin relative to accumulated flow. If that ratio of precipitation to flow changes, that may also indicate that channel geometry has changed. So finally, we have our rating curves and we can prepare a hydrograph, which is just a time series of, it's a record of flow that we've developed from our continuous record of depth. So, uh, we can characterize flow in the OSF. But first, you know, there's a lot of processes that are controlling how water is being released from the basins on the Olympic Peninsula. It's, the Olympic Peninsula, is, it's a, a pretty, pretty cool area. There's geologic processes, which are on million-year timescales. Then you have glacial processes, which are operating on thousand to million-year timescales. And finally, what we're all interested in, the, the humans, us. And important in understanding how all those different processes are affecting how water is released from a basin is regolith. So regolith, you've got your bedrock here. Regolith is everything above your, your sort of solid and permeable bedrock that can store water. You've got the fractured bedrock that has little weathered seams in the, the fractures, the weathered in place bedrock, soil, colluvium, and why the regolith is important is because it affects the water budget, which is you know, essentially a, a conceptual model of how water is partitioned inside of a basin. When precipitation falls in a basin, where does it go? Uh, if you have a thick regolith that's really permeable, a lot of it might go into your regolith, be stored, and maybe be released later in the summer. If your uh, watershed surface is impermeable, a lot of it might run off, and you might get rapid response to a precipitation event. So, for example, in our basins, this was during uh, about a 1.3 year event in the Klawa River where we had really intense precipitation. 
So that precipitation was exceeding the infiltration capacity of that soil, and we had a lot of quick flow responses active in the basin. We've got shallow water flow, maybe even flow on the surface that's causing the stream to react immediately to that precipitation. And then in these situations, which is normally what we see when we go out in the field, uh, you don't have the quick flow processes active, you have more of that base flow. Uh, the water that's been stored in the regolith is slowly flowing down and being released into the stream. So now, an uh, we have an understanding, I guess, of how regolith is affecting the water budget, so we'll get back to the processes. This is a molehill. It's in my backyard. It kind of works as an analogy for the Olympic Peninsula and the geology in the peninsula. <laughs> so the mole hill was there in the morning. Uh, something, a mole, worked to uplift the, the earth or the soil underneath the grass. It maybe lifted up a little bit of grass, but then also uh, created a mound of the material that the mole was pushing up. I came along with my shovel. I eroded the mole hill and exposed, one, the process that caused the uplift, the mole, there was a bunch of loose dirt there, but then you also had the grass around, which has the roots of the grass and was stronger. So in much the same way, the Olympic Peninsula is being uplift, except instead of a mole, we have sediments that have accumulated on top of the uh, Honda Fuca plate. As it's subducting underneath our continental plate, those sediments are being scraped off and they're causing uplift, just like the mole. Instead of a giant shovel, we've got glaciers, landslides. Those have caused erosion, and just like our molehill, have removed the mound, exposing the process or the area that caused the uplift. In this case, there isn't a giant molehole. It's those, those weak sediments that were barely lithified when they were, or barely turned into rock when they were uplifted, but they're exposed in the center. And then on the outside, which would be our grass and the molehill, you have the crescent terrain, which has a lot of basalt. It's, it's harder rock. So what does that mean for our water balance or for our water budget? Regolith here, because it's this weaker rock, maybe thicker. The, the rock has been weathered a little deeper maybe. And here in this harder rock, regolith might be thinner. Okay, so where are our basins relative to that weak rock and the hard rock? We, most of our weak rock is here in the middle in the Olympic subduction complex. And then we've got several basins right here on the edge of the molehill in the harder rock. Now on top of the, the glaciers, we have continental and alpine, or on top of the geology, we have, we have glaciers. So down here I have a plot of sea level. This is for the last two million years. You can see about every 50 to 100,000 years it's going up and down, up and down, up and down. We're right here, sea level is high. When sea level is high, there's little ice. Every time sea level goes down, there's a lot of ice, so that this ice cap has been flickering on and off, sort of like a strobe light, for the last two million years. And each time it does that, it extends all the way down to the Olympic Peninsula. It's doing two things. One, it's scouring. So in areas where there might be weathered regolith, it's removing that regolith and sh making that a shorter, shorter regolith column. It's also depositing material, and that the material it's depositing serves also as a reservoir to store, store water. So this is creating, in addition to sort of the, the variability in geology, we're getting variability caused by the glaciers because they're removing material and adding material. So this is the rough extent of the continental glacier. So we've got, again, those three basins that were up in the, the crescent terrain. Those are also in our glacial, continental glacier terrain. And then finally, humans. So we've been here for about 150 years with machines altering mostly the surface of the earth on the Olympic Peninsula. Uh, early techniques of logging really compacted the surface, so that, that would have altered the permeability of that upper part of the surface and perhaps altered how much is entering the regolith to be stored later as, uh, for, for our slow release of water. Pretty crude techniques. And they were doing that really on a landscape scale. It wasn't just small, little tiny harvest areas. Now we're in the present day where we have advanced logging techniques, we have smaller harvest areas, we don't have to build as many roads, we've got these mobile yarders where you can just throw them up on the hill slope without having to do a lot of road work to get them there. We've got uh, efficient uh, sh shovel yarding systems that minimize the amount of pressure on the soil and our roads are being located so they're not altering 
the, the surface flow of the water. So, okay, that's the background knowledge. Now we can look at our flow data. So with that sort of that idea of uh, regolith and how it might be affecting the release of water and then all those different processes, geological, glacial, and then the human, uh, this is just flow during a wet month at five of the basins. So this was during a big storm and I don't know, I'm sort of looking at this for the first time too, to be honest. So, but it looks like they're all sort of responding the same. It looks like it was maybe one big weather front that moved over all the basins. These basins are spread both up in the, the northern part of the peninsula and then down in the middle. So that they've all got peaks that seem to time about the same. There is one interesting thing, the, this light blue line, that's the recession curve of the hydrograph of the flow, how it's receding. You can see that this blue one is receding slower. Basin 694, that's located in the middle of the peninsula and that soft rock, it happens to have not been glaciated maybe for hundreds of thousands of years. So it's possible it has thick regolith that stored a lot of water and was releasing water slowly, maybe, but maybe it's something else. And then during a dry month, we can look at those same five basins. Here, there's quite a bit of variation in the timing and size of the peaks. Uh, that could just, you know, in the summer, maybe these are isolated storms. So a lot of this could just be how precipitation was moving across the peninsula. But sort of the interesting takeaway here is this, here's base flow. This was after that dry 2015 year that uh, Warren was talking about. All these basins are down about zero except for this red one. That's basin 642. About a third of that basin is covered by an alpine glacial deposit, 100 foot thick alpine glacial deposit. So it's, it seems to, even in these dry years, it's stored all that water in the glacial deposit and is releasing it about the same rate. That, that sort of the effect of those glacial deposits. So in conclusion, um, we figured out a method for developing rating curves. Uh, it still needs to be improved, but we figured out a better method for improving our rating curves. And going forward, there's going to be a lot of variables that we need to consider in evaluating what's controlling how water is released from the basins. And for future studies, you know, this data may be useful for doing studies maybe comparable to what the H.G. Andrews is doing or, or some sort of experimental design. So, thanks for listening. <laughs>